Let me introduce our two panelists. On my left is John Kendrick, a professor of economics at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. He's an adjunct scholar at the American Enterprise Institute as well. Mr. Kendrick has held other distinguished positions in the past, including that of Chief Economist of the U.S. Chamber, I'm sorry, the U.S. Department of Commerce, and Vice President for Economic Research at the Conference Board, a respected industry-sponsored research organization based in New York. Mr. Kendrick is the author of many articles and several books on economic growth, including the book Understanding Productivity. Charles Halton, on my right, is a senior research associate at the Urban Institute in Washington, a widely known and respected nonprofit research group. Previously, he taught economics at the Johns Hopkins University, and he too has written extensively about the sources of economic growth. He is co-author of a recent book, The Legacy of Reaganomics, Prospects for Long-Term Growth. Now let me turn to our topic. For almost two centuries, the U.S. economy has grown at an average annual rate of about three and a half or four percent a year. For a quarter century after World War II, that's from 1948 to 1973, the growth was about on track at 3.7 percent a year on average. Sometimes it was more, sometimes it was less as we had recessions and recoveries. Over that time, our population was also growing. But even on a per capita basis during that period, the nation's real output of goods and services grew 2.2% a year. At that rate, each person's real income would double every 33 years, once a generation. That's a good long-term record. However, it's far from being the best in the world. Most other industrial countries, and many developing countries as well, have done better since 1950. Furthermore, more recently, from 1973 to 1981, total U.S. growth slowed down to about 2.2 percent a year, and on a per capita basis, to less than 1.5 percent a year. Now, those don't sound like very large differences, but over a number of years, they make a very large difference. Most recently, despite a strong initial recovery from the 1981-82 recession, productivity growth has again slowed down since the middle of last year and now seems to be running about 2.5% a year and perhaps even less. So what is the outlook for the rest of the decade? And what policy measures, if any, might be taken to assure continued strong growth of productivity, our output of goods and services, and of our incomes? To answer these questions, I think we need to start by trying to understand better some of the basic forces that generate economic growth. So let's start our discussion at that point. Professor Kendrick, what are some of the major forces? that cause an economy to grow? Well, in the immediate sense, there's the growth of the productive resources of the economy. Number one, human resources, our labor inputs into production. Number two, the non-human resources of man-made capital and developed natural resources. But even more important than the growth of resources and inputs is the increase in productivity. Most broadly defined, productivity is the ratio of output to the labor and capital inputs, capital including natural resources. Uh, more frequ frequently, we think of productivity as output per labor hour, in which case uh, it increases because of increases in total productivity and because of increases in capital per worker or per man hour. Now behind each of these elements, the labor input, the uh, growth of capital, and the growth of productivity, you have many underlying causal forces as well. In the current circumstance, uh, I mentioned we'd had a slowdown in productivity growth. Which element of that was it 
that suddenly slowed down? Did we have a problem with capital? Did we have fewer workers working fewer hours? Or was something else going on so that the mix of those didn't work as well as it had before? Well, the labor growth has continued uh, quite strong. The uh, population, 16 years and over, that uh, is a potential supply of labor has continued to grow better than 2% a year. Uh, capital growth continued strong uh, until 1973, but then on a per worker basis, it has slowed somewhat since 1973. But the main source of a slowing in, pro uh, in economic growth has been the slowing in productivity growth. And uh, again, there are at least half a dozen factors behind that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Halton, what, uh, what has happened in the capital area, uh, which is an area I know that, that you have looked mm -hmm. at very closely, uh, what uh, caused uh, that shift in the amount of growth and the amount of capital available, machines, buildings, whatever, standing behind each worker? Well, uh, I think th there were a number of factors at work throughout the 70s. Um, the 70s were a period of inflation, and certainly toward the end of the decade, a very high rate of inflation. And uh, one effect of the inflation was to increase the effective tax rate on capital. So capital became less, less profitable to use, and therefore there was somewhat less of it. Another uh, factor, uh, which is also very important, uh, was the very rapid increase in energy prices that occurred as a result of the uh, formation of OPEC. Uh, we had uh, two major energy shocks, and since uh, much capital uses energy, uh, it made capital more expensive to use. So I would uh, cite these as two of the major factors uh, underlying the uh, uh, relatively uh, slow performance of capital. I think it's also important to f uh, point out, though, that when John says uh, some, that uh, capital uh, per worker uh, tended to show poorly, it was to some extent due to the rapid expansion of the workforce. Okay. That was responsible for the, for the ratio, if you will, uh, changing. Yes, the growth of the labor force speeded up after 66 as the baby boom yeah. bulge moved into the working ages. Uh, that, 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 that's yeah. true. So that's one reason that's capital right. per worker slowed. But I think there was a, a decline in the rate of growth of total capital after that's 73, right. was there not? There was. It, uh, it tended to be more uh, pronounced for structures than for equipment. The uh, equipment growth is uh, really quite respectable by historical standards. Mm -hmm by no means what it was necessary to match the increase in the uh, workforce, however. One subject that often uh, gets brought into these discussions is question of saving. Uh, was, did anything happen to our willingness to deny ourselves things today that we want, whether cars or uh, vacation homes or whatever, and save for the future, invest for the future. Uh, was there, in a sense, a capital shortage because we weren't saving enough? Uh, was that part of the problem? Uh, not in my view, but uh, that's a somewhat controversial uh, answer, I think. Maybe John would have a different uh, view. Well, certainly the saving rates remained relatively constant even after the Economic Recovery Tax Act of 81, supposedly. Uh, designed in part to stimulate saving, there has been no perceptible increase in the amount of saving. However, that is a potential route that we may come to later for raising productivity is increasing the effective rate of saving in the economy. But so far, it has stayed at around a uh, little better than a sixth of, of total national income. I see. Well, let, let me sum up what we've said so far. We had a slowing in the 1970s of growth of the economy, slowing of productivity growth. We had a faster rate of growth of the labor force. Uh, we had, uh, in Mr. Halton's opinion, no shortage of capital, so to speak. But we didn't have a speed up in the amount of capital being provided to match the speed up in the labor force so that that ratio between the two uh, would have remained the same. Instead, it fell, and 
I guess we're sort of assuming here that that ratio is important for productivity growth. The more capital standing mm -hmm. behind a worker, mm -hmm. the more likely his output is to be higher for each hour he works. That's right. The growth of capital goods per worker is certainly an important element in increasing output mm -hmm. per worker. Okay. Well, during this period, we also had some very unstable uh, economic uh, times. Uh, mm -hmm. as, so. as you mentioned, we had um, high inflation. Uh, we had a severe recession in the middle 1970s. Uh, we had wage and price controls earlier uh, in the period. We had, uh, at the end of the decade, the beginning of another recession, a period of recessions that continued for several years. Uh, how did the recessions themselves, business cycle, affect uh, growth of productivity and growth mm -hmm. of our standard of living? Well, in two ways. For one thing, when we have a recession, productivity growth tends to uh, be less or actually drop in the uh, two major recessions since 73, uh, productivity actually fell. Uh, then the more months of recession you have in a given period of time, say a decade, uh, the less the productivity growth would tend to be. For one thing, in recessions, we lose a certain amount of uh, capital investment that may not be made up fully in subsequent recovery. So I would say the instability in the major recessions of 73, 75, then again in 81 and 82, did uh, definitely uh, contribute to the slowing of growth. And with slower growth, you get a, uh, fewer economies of scale uh, that come from greater specialization and spreading of overhead units over more uh, units of output, overhead costs over more units of output. So uh, uh, it's a, a vicious circle. Slower uh, growth means less productivity, less, uh, and uh, uh, the lesser productivity reacts back on the, on the growth rate. Well, what about, again, the question of inflation, uh, another major instability in the 70s mm -hmm. and one that <coughs> this country had not had much experience with, mm -hmm. uh, at least for sustained periods of time. Mm -hmm. uh, looking back at that period, and uh, do you think now and going forward from now that we could again obtain the kind of growth rates that we had prior to the 70s in terms of real output and incomes without again experiencing high inflation? Well, I I think that uh, when we, if we're going to look back to the 60s, we're uh, looking back to a period of unusually high growth, uh, a growth binge, if you will. And you know, th I think the, the U.S., uh, in fact, started the post-war period with a uh, very dominant position in the world economy. We were, I think, very well positioned to grow. And I, my own interpretation of, of this era was that uh, not that uh, the current period is so bad, but uh, the immediate post-war period in the 60s were really quite good. Uh, you're, I, you're suggesting that our standard of measurement right. may not be quite correct, that the slowdown we've been talking about in some longer historical sense might have been a return in part to a more normal condition rather than a slowing uh, that we ought seriously to be concerned about? No, I, I, I wouldn't. No, I think we sh definitely should be concerned about the slowing. But I'm suggesting that uh, the slowdown looks uh, particularly bad when compared <laughs> to a period of very high economic growth. And I th as I know John Kendrick has uh, often said, uh, our, our growth tends to go in, in long-term cycles. And uh, I, I don't think we, we want to look at either the, the, the good part or the bad part of the cycle as the uh, point from which to extrapolate to the future. Mm -hmm. I would hope that we would be able to at least uh, split the difference in terms of the long run. So a realistic goal uh, or hope would not be a return to the 60s with very strong growth, very low inflation, very high productivity growth, uh, but something less than that uh, right. over a long period of time. Yes. And I, uh, is, is, do you agree with that? In part uh, only. 
I do think that it's unlikely we come back to the 3.2 percent rate of increase in real product per labor hour that we had for the first 25 years uh, after the war uh, because of some of the factors Chuck mentioned, recovery from the war, the ex this expansion of the world economy at a strong rate and so on. Uh, however, I think we can do much better than the 1 percent or so we had from 73 to 81 when real product itself was only growing at 2.2 percent. Uh, one reason for the slowdown after 73 was the fact that the amount spent for research and development was declining as a percent of GNP from 3 percent in the mid-60s down to 2.2 percent in 1977-78. Uh, now, research and development is the fountainhead of invention and thus of innovation and technological progress, which is a major cause of productivity growth. Uh, since uh, 78, government has been appropriating more money for R&D, and private research and development spending has gone ahead more strongly. I think that could alone give us better uh, productivity growth, particularly if we have a uh, fairly strong capital formation, since so much uh, cost-reducing technological change is embodied in new plants and equipment. So uh, uh, I, I don't think we'll come back to the highest rates of the past, but we should be able to come back, say, 2.5 percent productivity and with uh, uh, the labor hours worked growing 1 to 1.5 percent now that the uh, growth of the labor force probably will be slowing down in the years ahead. <coughs> that should give us, again, a, a growth rate of real GNP of 3.5 to 4 percent, the historic rate. I would hope to get back to that. Do you uh, think that's a realistic expectation? Well, uh, yes, realistic, maybe, from my view, slightly optimistic, but certainly attainable. I think it's, it's important to emphasize in, in uh, looking at the uh, 70s that uh, the dec that decade really uh, saw some very significant uh, changes in economic structure, changes which had in, indeed uh, started even in earlier. But um, the U.S. What, what do you mean by economic structure? structure. Well, uh, for one thing, the uh, U.S. economy became much more open to international trade and international competition than it had been. And I think we've, uh, we're now seeing some of the impacts on uh, some of the industries that have had to take some of the har hardest competition. And I, 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 so I think the, 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 the golden days of the 60s and 50s were, were, were days where we, we didn't have that kind of a problem to contend with nearly to the extent that we do now. And I, think th I don't think international competition is going to go away in the 80s and 90s. Uh, well, other th how, how does international competition, uh, which certainly has increased, we you know, look around and see foreign automobiles, mm -hmm. vast numbers, uh, and 30 years ago there were virtually none. That's right. uh, but how does that cause our economic growth to slow down? Couldn't we perhaps produce not as many automobiles as we would have if there was no foreign competition, but couldn't we produce more of something else that foreigners don't sell here? Uh, yes, in, in the longer run, but I think uh, the transition has been very painful. And I think there's another effect which uh, and probably ought to be mentioned, and that is that uh, in the immediate post-war environment, uh, the U.S. productivity levels, the, the levels relative to other countries were very, very high. And one of the things that's happened in the rest of the world is that their productivity levels have risen relative to ours. Now, what this tends to are, do... Are, 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 I hate to keep interrupting, okay. but I think of these things as you go past the okay. points. Uh, are the levels of productivity, the amount uh, of, of a product a, a worker produces each hour, are those levels now higher in other countries than they are here, or has it only been that we don't have an advantage that we used to have? It's the latter. It's, it's that they have been narrowing. I see. And one consequence of this narrowing is that um, we, that certain industries bear the brunt of the problem. It isn't, uh, the trade theory would uh, tell us that it is not the case that all industries should be equally affected by the progress made abroad in improving their productivity levels. 
In fact, uh, Paul Krugman of MIT and, and Robert Reich of, Har of Harvard have emphasized a very different uh, mechanism. Uh, they see basically the process in, as picking off the industries in the U.S. that were the lowest uh, productivity industries. So as the level of productivity elsewhere rises, the first people to p feel the pain are our low productivity industries. And uh, the, so the process uh, of uh, international competition will tend to drive us up the technology ladder. Now, uh, I completely agree with you that there is no reason that this should inevitably lead us to a slower growth rate. But I think the transition as we uh, retreat up the, the ladder is the level of water rises, so to speak, uh, mm -hmm. will, you know, it has been a problem. And, I, and I'd also mention that uh, w another aspect of this, this whole process is that it's, it's likely that many of the uh, new jobs created in the economy will come in the service sectors. Where we don't trade as much with foreign countries. Where we don't trade as much with foreign countries and which are labor intensive. Uh, and uh, just as a technical sidelight, it, is, it tends to be very difficult to measure output in those industries since so, so much of the output is intangible. And there's a question as to uh, when, when you pay for a doctor, uh, if you pay a $100 doctor bill, how much of that is price and how much of that is quality and how much of that is quantity. So, the, so that I think one of the problems in, in, in pondering future growth will be to what extent will we be growing on the basis of the quantity of output and to what extent will a lot of our future growth be uh, quality increasing. Well, let me come back to the measurement question because I think it's a broader problem perhaps even than you, you have suggested. Uh, let me ask uh, Professor Kendrick uh, first. Uh, if we have lost a relative advantage that we used to have, productivity has grown faster in other countries than it has here. Why is that? What, what have they done that we haven't done that caused them to be able to increase their productivity faster? There are two main reasons. One is that in general, the saving rate and the, thus the investment rate has been higher in uh, most other countries. In Japan, it's been uh, a third of GNP compared with our sixth partly due to more favorable tax re regulations, uh, also certain innate uh, propensities uh, toward thrift and so forth. Uh, so capital per worker has risen faster in many other advanced countries and even some of the uh, more rapidly developing LDCs. The second reason is uh, that uh, there has been technological catch-up, that is, we have uh, rather freely shared our technology. We've licensed patents. We've exported uh, sophisticated uh, machinery. Uh, our uh, multinational companies have set up subsidiaries abroad. And we've had many foreign uh, visitors and productivity teams come to study our method. That was part of our foreign policy after the war, to help other countries in reconstruction and development. And it has succeeded very well. And so we have this greater foreign competition. In that connection, I'd like to take issue with, uh, with uh, Chuck Hulton. Uh, I think that overall international competition is healthy and stimulates productivity growth uh, in, in uh, the countries affected, which almost all countries are these days. Uh, I think it's mainly a, um, an industry problem. Those industries in the U.S. that lag in productivity growth, as iron and steel and autos and shoes and other footwear and so on, they are the ones that suffer since uh, international trade is a matter of comparative advantage. And uh, <coughs> industries whose productivity is growing less than abroad uh, have uh, relatively rising costs and prices and uh, suffer an erosion of their markets. However, uh, we're always going to have industries behind the parade. Uh, let's say that uh, our iron and steel uh, industry uh, uh, is blessed with a miracle and uh, renovates and has high productivity growth and starts increasing its share of world markets. Then there would be uh, some other industry that lags behind the parade. So that's one reason I tend to oppose industrial policy. I think that uh, there are always industries in trouble. The important thing is that gradually resources be shifted from the industries that are declining into those which are growing uh, relatively. But I don't think the relative uh, 
rate of overall national productivity growth is really particularly affected by uh, our relative productivity, uh, or rather, let me say this, that the, our, our trade is not primarily a matter of relative productivity levels overall. It's more a matter of the value of the dollar in part. And uh, uh, that has been affected by financial flows as well as relative price level changes which are indirectly influenced by productivity. Well, could, could I just, just, Please. just, just make one point here, though? I, I think uh, one of this, the new realities that uh, we're just going to have to live with is that uh, as we see uh, countries around the world uh, achieve higher levels of development, and I think it would be particularly the case with some of the uh, advanced uh, LDC countries, uh, there's going to be uh, greater pressure on world resources. and. I think we can an anticipate uh, in the long run a competition for these resources. And there's also going to be competition for markets. And I, and I agree entirely with John that uh, this does have its pro efficiency aspects. But uh, I think there's also going to be uh, very substantial periods of instability, which will ha have impacts on growth. And we're, we're going to face increasing competition and uh, higher prices. And, I, and so, I mean, I think as a, as a general long-term proposition, I don't think we have any argument. But I, if we're looking at the next 20 years, I'm not so sure that uh, I would be quite as sanguine about the, uh, the beneficial uh, co uh, consequences of international but trade and international development. We've always had these relative resource shifts in resources. Agriculture used to be 90% of the economy. Now it's 3% in employment. I mean, this is going on all the time. Is it any different now from before? Well, we did have a period of very nasty readjustment in the agricultural sector, too, that went on for decades. So well, it's that's true. There are readjustment uh, problems. Let me ask a, a related question. President Reagan has said numerous occasions, officials in his administrations have said that one reason productivity growth didn't do any better than it did in the U.S. in the 1970s was over-regulation of business. Uh, how much uh, of the productivity slowdown in the decade do you think was related to uh, the way in which we regulated business? Did we over-regulate them? Well, my impression is that uh, the many of the regulations we had on the books weren't terribly effective, so it's really hard to know just how severely they bit on industry. I think there was a definite uh, trend toward regulation, and I think it was part of a, a larger um, attitude within society which uh, stressed non-growth goals. And, and I said the great society would be a, another aspect of this general attitude. And uh, I suspect that this did have some, some, some subtle effects on uh, the desire of business to uh, expand and for the economy to grow. It's, it's very difficult, I think, to quantify. Ed Dennison, another growth expert, estimates that uh, uh, the, regulatory, the increase in regulatory costs slowed productivity growth by 0.2 or 0.3, three-tenths of a percentage point, which is considerable. It's almost 10% uh, of the growth rate itself at its uh, uh, high point. Uh, regardless of whether the benefits of regulation have been worth the costs, it definitely slows productivity growth as measured because Gross national product does not include the goods of clean air, clean water, uh, greater uh, safety, and so forth. Uh, but the denominator of the productivity ratio does include the uh, increasing costs, input, increasing inputs uh, due to regulation. And I think one reason why uh, we may be getting some resurgence in productivity growth now is that uh, regulatory costs are leveling out pretty much as a ratio to GNP. All right. Before I turn to some questions from our audience, I have quite a few here. Uh, let me ask uh, Mr. Halton, uh, again, looking far from where mm -hmm. we are now, uh, what sort of policy measures should the U.S. government uh, be considering to try to increase our chances mm -hmm. uh, that Dr. Kendrick is right in terms of, we, uh, of, of reestablishing this favorable long-term growth trend? Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, completely agree with John that many of the uh, factors that were negatives in the 70s are going to turn around and, and 
and probably be positives for us uh, for the rest the next uh, two decades. And those, those are essentially long-term factors. On the, I'm less sanguine about the policy uh, environment for these next that is currently being projected. And I particularly am concerned about the size of the pro uh, projected <coughs> federal budget deficit. And secondarily, with the uh, strength of the dollar, which is related. Um, in some work that I did with uh, uh, Bell Sawhill, uh, we uh, came to the conclusion, uh, based on uh, papers presented at a conference that we uh, sponsored, that uh, the crowding out problem could be extremely serious. Uh, even a conservative estimate of the amount of investment lost through crowding out, which I guess I ought to s not be technical here and say, st say that uh, when the federal government takes a dollar of s savings uh, in the form of inducing an investor to hold a government bond, this means that less money is available for other types of investment, including investment in business plant and equipment. Now, uh, the question is how much crowding out, how much uh, of a reduction in plant and equipment do we get from this $1 of uh, deficit financed by uh, Treasury uh, bonds and bills? And uh, an estimate ba uh, that I particularly like is something on the order of uh, 20 to 25 cents on the dollar. Okay. Now, if you multiply that by times a two bil $200 billion deficit, you can see we're talking about some very substantial reductions in business fixed investment. And I think if, and, and now, if, if a quarter of 200 is 50, uh, how big is business investment? Uh, well, in, in real terms, terms, it's something on the order of, uh, I think it's uh, 200 billion. Uh, John is looking it up here. He can, uh, in nominal terms, it's considerably higher, and, and un uncorrected for inflation. Actually, it's uh, plant and equipment spending, I see, is up to uh, uh, 384 billion, so estimated for 85. In, yeah. in nominal dollars? In nominal dollars. That's yes. right. Mm -hmm. So if we're dropping off, it, well, in, it, it's the real investment which determines the greater growth of the capital stock. And if we drop off uh, $50 billion from that, uh, we're going to have a problem. In, in the growth of capital. And I think this is, this is a problem that recurs year after year after year, so long as we're running these big deficits. Now, I don't uh, for a moment believe that uh, we're going to do that. I, uh, somehow, some way, uh, the President and Congress are going to come to an accommodation where they're going to get that deficit down. So I, I think that uh, the, lo the long-term uh, forecast absent that is, is quite positive, but I s don't think that we should be too self-congratulatory until we solve some of our, our major macro problems. And so I think my, if by way of a very long and indirect answer to your question, I think the major thing that we have to do in, by way of a policy uh, package to uh, stimulate long-term growth is to do something about the deficits. Would you like to take a shot at the same question? What policy changes, if any, would you recommend to give us faster and better growth in the future? Well, I think some of the features of the very recent proposal by the President on uh, uh, tax reform uh, certainly uh, can help uh, some further reduction in personal tax rates through uh, broadening the tax base uh, and some increase in IRA contributions, including a, a full 2000 for non-working spouses, would tend to increase personal savings somewhat, which will be helpful. I think the continuation of the uh, incremental R&D tax credit will help to continue to stimulate the increase in private research and development, and I feel sure that uh, uh, the government will continue to appropriate increasing sums for uh, uh, research and development, particularly basic research and that which uh, is connected with uh, national security purposes. Uh, however. I wouldn't expect any major effect on growth from his proposals, but uh, uh, I personally would uh, like to see a consumed income tax in which saving would be totally exempt from taxation. I think that would really get our saving rate up. Uh, a value-added type tax would also uh, not fall on saving, since it would be on uh, uh, 
on production of goods and services. Uh, uh, but uh, I think politically that would be harder to uh, get. But uh, uh, Congressman De Consini wasn't it uh, proposed a uh, a consumed income type tax, uh, which uh, to me would be more effective. However, I think the present reforms are uh, long overdue and will be marginally helpful to growth. All right. Well, let me turn to some of the questions that our audience, uh, quite informally here, has. Uh, uh, has, has sent up to us. Uh, earlier I raised the question, uh, or you, I guess raised the question, and I mentioned it again, of me measurement. Um, we've got, uh, what, 235, 240 million people in this country. We have uh, more than 100 million of them at work uh, <coughs> producing all kinds of things. Um, how do we, how do we know with any reasonable certainty how efficiently they actually produce something. How, how good are our numbers? A uh, question specifically from one member of the audience uh, uh, asked about uh, uh, computer chips uh, <coughs> that have become over time vastly uh, more efficient uh, at vastly lower price. Uh, are our measurements sufficiently sophisticated to incorporate what's going on with computers, this technological revolution we have. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, uh, no statistics are perfect. <laughs> uh, and that particular uh, example. But are, are they very good? I guess uh, <laughs> that's the other question. Well, that reminds me of the old Henny Youngman joke. <laughs> but uh, a good relative to what? Mm -hmm. um, I think they do. Uh, give a, uh, a fairly rough and decent picture of how we're doing over time. I think that picture becomes a lot more blurred as we look at specific industries and it, the narrower we get, if we narrowed it down to uh, the computer industry or com computer using industries, I think uh, for, uh, in many instances we may have some very inaccurate uh, pictures. but. Um, I'm sure the national income accountants would be delighted to have more money to, to improve the quality of their statistics. Um, could I add that uh, as uh, the person who was responsible for the initial um, real GNP estimates when I worked at the Commerce Department back in 1950, that we were quite aware of the fact that we could not adequately capture improvements in quality of goods and services over time. Uh, I think in the initial article that George Yossi and I wrote in uh, the January 1951 survey of current business, we pointed out that probably real product and productivity numbers are subject to some indeterminate downward bias. Uh, uh, and since it's indeterminate, we can't say how much, uh, but uh, uh, you, you mean over time that over you time, systematically would over give a number time, that was too low? Yes. Relative uh, to reality. Yes, we're doing better than the numbers indicate, particularly as the world's great consumer society. Uh, our producers are knocking themselves out to improve consumer goods. Uh, the producer, producer's goods improvements get into uh, productivity uh, uh, numbers, but there again it doesn't get into the real product. And I think that that bias may have become worse in recent years as we've moved into the information society with uh, computer output becoming quite significant. The, uh, the Commerce Department has followed the convention of keeping the price deflator constant. Obviously, in any uh, sense of performance, the price of computers has gone down significantly if you look at the number of computations per uh, uh, second and so on. So uh, uh, I think that maybe the bias is greater, which may be some portion of this slowdown. I think there's a real slowdown in productivity growth. There has been up until 82 anyway. And uh, some of that may be statistical, but I think also uh, there's something real there as well. Another area that uh, some, uh, may well affect uh, productivity changes uh, involve the workforce that is organized, uh, uh, members of unions that work under collective bargaining agreements. Uh, one member of the audience asks, uh, 
to what extent do union work rules exert negative effects on productivity? For example, union work rules require Amtrak uh, engineers to change after only a two-hour shift, uh, a carryover from the time when distance traveled determined the length of the work day. In other words, I guess now they go as far in two hours as they used to go in whatever eight, ten hours normal day was. Um, how important are union work rules, restrictions on management practices that are, that are embodied in these collective uh, uh, agreements, and has that become more or less of a problem over time? Well, this is a uh, subject of active controversy, as you might imagine. And there has uh, been a number of uh, academic papers written on this. And uh, the example quoted in, 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 in you know, just by, by you just a moment ago certainly suggests that uh, the potential for reducing productivity is very real. But uh, on the other side of the ledger, uh, researchers have tended to argue that uh, the unions provide a, an environment of uh, worker satisfaction and also uh, some degree of worker screening, which tends to raise the productivity of a highly unionized industry. So there are uh, researchers have tended to find uh, counteracting effects, and it's really very difficult to quantify. Uh, and I guess I, I wouldn't really want to, to do it right now. I don't think it's a terribly big effect because uh, uh, the unionized proportion of the labor force is uh, little more than uh, 20 percent. Um, and I don't think that the effect has changed a great deal until the last several years. And then uh, I think there's been a lessening of these restrictive work rules and practices. And that is one reason I'm somewhat more optimistic for the rest of the day. Continue, with the continued international competition will undoubtedly face, I think that unions are going to have to tend to be more cooperative with management just to keep their jobs. And that's a big consideration for the worker is producing at a low enough cost to compete and to keep his employment. Mm -hmm. Another member of the audience refers to something that you mentioned uh, earlier uh, in the program, uh, quoting uh, the work of Edward Dennison, who mm -hmm. was uh, uh, formerly uh, uh, at the Bureau of Economic Analysis at the Commerce Department and at the Brookings Institution, uh, noting that he, f as you said, found that uh, question of slowdown in capital investment uh, was not responsible for uh, more than a couple of tenths or so of the slowdown in productivity growth. And the member of the audience asked, why then should we give tax incentives to stimulate physical investment? Well, there are two reasons. For one thing, quite apart from the effect on productivity, capital as a factor of production uh, uh, does augment output. Uh, plus the fact that uh, in addition to increasing labor productivity as you have more equipment per worker, uh, the capital goods are a carrier of technological progress. And the latest technology uh, comes into the economy through the uh, purchase and use of the, new, uh, of the new capital goods. That's another reason I'm somewhat optimistic for coming years is with this big uh, boom in investment of the last couple of years, which may be further stimulated by uh, the tax reform uh, and also by lowering of interest rates, if we do get a cut in the deficit in particular, uh, I think that we uh, will be having stronger investment and, uh, and that will carry through into productivity. Let me turn, uh, Mr. Halton, back to something you mentioned in uh, about services sector of the economy uh, and its growth. Another member of the audience uh, asks that with services sector growing relative to the goods producing sector and generally services having less capital per worker than manufacturing industries, for instance, uh, could that be an explanation of uh, this decline in the total amount of capital standing behind each worker. And if, it, if that was part of the explanation, would then that decline in the relationship of capital to workers necessarily be something we ought to worry about? Well, uh, my reading of the evidence uh, produced by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is uh, 
has recently come out with uh, official statistics on the uh, partitioning of growth between capital, labor, and uh, total factor productivity, uh, basically suggests that uh, the, the productivity is a, is a really is a prime motive force in, in, in economic growth. Uh, you know, I guess I don't really look to, uh, to capital as playing that strategic a role. Uh, I guess it, it is possible that the uh, reduction in, a, in the equipment of service sector workers could have played a role, but my reading of the BLS data on the capital side su suggests that equipment investment was really decently strong. So it, it, it doesn't seem, it, 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 if we're talking about the actual equipment uh, worker ratio, I wouldn't uh, think that uh, this would be a factor. What seemed to be a problem was uh, more inventory and uh, structures and, and how that uh, relates to the service sector. I just would have a hard time uh, saying. Okay. Another uh, area of concern to a member of our audience uh, here is the consistently high level of unemployment that we have had in this country now for, for quite a few years, high relative again to the 60s and even uh, uh, early parts of the 70s. Uh, the question is, would you expect these rather high rates of productivity uh, increase to contribute uh, to sharply reduced uh, rates of unemployment in the future? In other words, with more growth, do you get reduction in unemployment? Or alternatively, is the way some unions I know have looked at the question of productivity growth in the past, is sort of a speed up. Productivity means I got to work harder on the assembly line or wherever. Uh, does pr productivity growth help us reduce unemployment over time? Or does it at the same time, perhaps more importantly, add to problems of unemployment? Well, productivity, which reflects technological change, <laughs> is associated with some labor displacement in certain occupations and industries and regions, and the need to shift for that labor to shift into uh, other areas where demand for labor is increasing. However, uh, I don't think that uh, the rate of productivity growth or technological advance is a major determinant of the overall level of employment and unemployment which is really determined by macroeconomic policies. I think that over a period of quarters, our policy makers and the Council of Economic Advisers, the Treasury, the Budget Bureau, and so forth, that they can uh, aim for a rate of economic growth which will absorb the growth in the labor force, uh, offset the increase in productivity, and prevent an increase in unemployment, or indeed contribute to a decrease in unemployment. And with uh, almost 7.5% unemployment now, I would hope that in the uh, years ahead we would uh, reduce the rate of unemployment to uh, 6 to 6.5% at least, which was mentioned in the Council of Economic Advisors report of uh, 84 as being the natural rate of unemployment by which they mean the rate below which wage rates and prices tend to accelerate. I think it is desirable if we aim for uh, a natural rate of growth of output uh, with sufficient reserves of labor and of capacity that we're able to accommodate the shifts in the economy that are going on all the time due to technology and changes in demand and so forth without uh, shortages and bottlenecks uh, appearing. And I think that may be a somewhat higher rate than we've had in the past on average, maybe around 6% unemployment and around 86% uh, rate of manufacturing capacity. But we can certainly uh, have a, a strong growth rate given those reserves, and that will help to hold down the rate of inflation. Another member of the audience uh, asks that question I've heard a number of times, uh, and that is, uh, is it possible that recessions, hard times, uh, cause managers, entrepreneurs, to move forward in cost-cutting ways, making investments to increase productivity, so that uh, a recession 
not uh, your comments notwithstanding, uh, the recession may not lead in the end to faster productivity growth rather than slower. How, how, what's the balance of forces there? Well, I think there are a balance of forces. Uh, and clearly, uh, hard times like make people look more carefully at the bottom line. And I think that does tend to enhance productivity by making firms cost conscious. Uh, it also, uh, however, uh, causes a uh, decline in investment. And uh, to the extent, as John has pointed out, that this means the embodiment of technology, you have a, a negative factor there. And, and also, um, there's, it, it can have some adverse uh, consequences uh, within the labor force where uh, individuals uh, uh, coming, that would normally have come in and gotten into the primary workforce uh, do not do so, and uh, perhaps we lose some human capital there. So there is a balance, and again, it's, it's, this is a very difficult one to quantify. I th uh, the research that I'm aware of would suggest that the net effect is probably fairly low. Uh, Dr. Kendrick, uh, do you think that we ought to be emphasizing different things in our educational system in order to increase productivity and future growth? Well, in a market economy, we tend to produce uh, uh, people in occupations and professions trained for these uh, uh, types of work for which there is a demand. If someone thinks there are too many lawyers, and I've heard it suggested that we could solve our trade balance problem with Japan by exporting half of our lawyers to Japan, which <laughs> has a far lower ratio of lawyers, it's because uh, our institutions are such that uh, we have uh, considerable uh, adversarial uh, relationships, and uh, I think that there could be uh, steps taken to try to reduce the amount of litigation in uh, our society. That would be a social invention that would increase productivity. The, the productivity increasing innovations are not just mechanical. We can make uh, changes in the institutional structure. And I would like to see changes that would reduce the demand for lawyers and increase the demand for economists. <laughs> <laughs> what would happen if we were to export more economists to Japan? Well, they, I think they have enough uh, uh, already there. Uh, a lot of our economists do work abroad in, uh, in, in less developed uh, countries. Uh, uh, and I think we're becoming somewhat more uh, skillful and adept at giving uh, policy advice. Uh, but uh, I certainly think we need to train increasing numbers of, of, of uh, uh, other scientists and engineers uh, uh, if we indeed we do get a continued increase in research and development, and this should bode well for future productivity gains. Well, we have just a couple of moments left uh, before we wrap up this uh, hour's discussion on productivity growth and what influences it. Uh, quickly, again, how optimistic are you, uh, Mr. Halton, about productivity growth in the future and about uh, uh, the fact that our standard of living will continue to rise? I'm uh, relatively optimistic. I think that uh, the underlying uh, factors that make for productivity growth will be uh, uh, fairly favorable for the next two decades. I still, I'd like to re-emphasize, however, the potential negative impact of our macro policies with respect to the deficits and the overly uh, strong dollar. So I think we, it's, it's, I'm optimistic if we uh, have the will to take on and solve our problems. Professor Kendrick? Well, I won't go two decades out. I'll only go to the year 2000 and say that uh, <laughs> okay. I am optimistic because uh, I think there are servo mechanisms in the economy and in society that tend to reverse negative tendencies. That is why we have the so-called Kuznets long swing in economic activity. We have periods of rapid growth followed by periods of slower growth. But toward the end of the period of slower growth, uh, natural forces developed and also social measures developed to uh, get the economy back uh, moving again. After the slowdown of the last 60s, uh, John F. Kennedy came in on the pledge to get America moving again. We had a dozen years of rapid growth through 73, then a slowing, and uh, I think uh, one of the reasons that uh, we had a change in administration in 19. Uh, 
8081 was uh, the, uh, the economic problems, and I think we're on the way to solving those for the intermediate term. Uh, I think we will get a uh, substantial cut in the deficit for the coming year, particularly when both parties seem to be vying with each other as to uh, the credit they can get out of this. I think that uh, real interest rates will come down. I think that uh, R&D will continue to rise and we'll have more investment. And uh, therefore, uh, I think that growth uh, can get back on this 200-year uh, track of uh, four percent or thereabouts. Well, thank you both very much uh, for joining us for this hour. Charles Holton of the Urban Institute, John Kendrick of George Washington University. Now, on behalf of the National Economist Club Educational Foundation, this is John Barry saying goodbye. <laughs>